All right. Thanks everyone for attending our ISAT Senior Symposium. We have Jeff, Cameron, and Keaton presenting on the artificial leaf. Take it away, guys. Hello, I'm Keaton. I'm Jeffrey. I'm Cameron. And our capstone project for the year was the artificial leaf, and our advisor was Dr. David Lawrence. So I'm just going to give a little quick overview about what we're going to talk about. First, we're going to give a little introduction to what an artificial leaf is. And then we're going to get into the long-term history, stakeholders, um, touch on the ethical and cultural dimensions, uh, hit on the met methods and materials, then finish up with the results and the conclusion. So here's just a little background on what an artificial leaf is. An artificial leaf is a photoelectrochemical photoelectro process that splits water um, into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, and this is done by only using sunlight. Um, this mimics the first step of photosynthesis, which you can see right here. Uh, you take a water molecule, you add a little bit of sunlight, and then you can get a byproduct of oxygen and hydrogen. Um, and this just promotes the photovoltaic splitting of water, and this can be used for sustainable hydrogen production. And I'm just going to give you a little rundown of the long-term history uh, with the artificial leaf. It uh, was first pioneered by a guy named uh, David Nocera, a professor of energy at Harvard. Um, but since around the 1970s, there's been work in water splitting technology, but the leaf itself is just a uh, pretty recent <coughs> innovation. Uh, the artificial leaf is in itself the power supply, the anode, and the cathode um, for the photoelectrochemical uh, water splitting process. Uh, with further development, uh, this will enable cost-effective production of hydrogen by using sunlight as its only input. Um, uh, scientists across the world currently are working on uh, similar projects. I know in, at MIT there's a bunch of projects going on, Harvard, as well as the University of Pittsburgh. And here at JMU, uh, our advisor, Dr. David Lawrence, has been working with PV cells, photocatalysts, and the Artificial Leaf Project since uh, August of 2016. All right, so just a little bit about our, or our artificial leaf here at JMU. So this is a picture of it right here. Um, just to give you a little bit of perspective, it's pretty much no bigger than your thumbnail. Um, but these are the different layers that are combined into this leaf. Um, it starts with a layer of bismuth vanadate on the outside. Um, this layer promotes the production of hydrogen. After that, there's an uh, electrocontact layer. And this is a uh, tin oxide layer. It also protects the leaf from the corrosive effects of salt water. And then you have a layer of um, gallium arsenide phosphide, and this is what uh, creates the PV cell. And I'm gonna pass out just a few examples of these materials. I'm um, gonna go over some of the stakeholders involved with this. So the end goal of this project is to create an, an efficient leaf that splits water into hydrogen and oxygen using sunlight. The hydrogen could then be captured and used as a, sta a sustainable fuel. Um, the leaf itself can split water, resulting hydrogen can later be stored and burned uh, in a fuel cell to produce electricity and pure water as a byproduct. Uh, so major stakeholders that would be involved would be oil companies, car manufacturers, utility companies, and infrastructure, global infrastructure, because um, currently, uh, as we all know, fossil fuels are kind of promoting this global climate change uh, problem, so we're constantly looking to find renew renewable and sustainable sources of energy. And some ethical and cultural dimensions. As Keaton mentioned, the uh, products are gallium arsenide phosphide, um, zinc oxide, fluorine, doped tin oxide, um, tungsten oxide, and business vanadate. Um, so our issues with this are the corrosive properties of salt water. And since one of our main, our PV cell has arsenic inside of it, uh, we're worried about it kind of leaking into the water supply and causing to toxic effects. Uh, so that's one kind of issue that we're looking at. So maybe in the future we're trying to see um, further research without this material. Um, and then also a series of infra infrastructure changes would be needed in order to support hydrogen as a fuel. So our goals and improvements of this project would be, uh, number one, increase the efficiency of the photovoltaic cell. Number two, increase the voltage output of the artificial leaf. We're going to be experimenting with tungsten oxide. We had it on about half of our leaves. Um, it's just a material that some people claim helps improve the photovoltaic characteristics. 
and we're going to be improving the soldering of wires for more accurate testing. And all these kind of add up to the main goal of the project, which is increasing the hydrogen output of the artificial leaf. So our materials that, and methods that we use, the gallium arsenide phosphide, which is the main solar cell of the artificial leaf, um, that material comes as an N-type material. And so we need to turn it into a PN junction through the zinc oxide deposition and diffusion. The PN junction allows electricity to actually flow through the cell. Um, then we have the fluorine dope tin oxide, which is the transparent electrical conductor, which allows um, sunlight to pass through because it's transparent and it provides a good electrical contact between the photovoltaic cell and the bismuthanidate. The tungsten oxide, we put on about half of our cells. Um, the best cell that we had, however, did not have tungsten oxide. We'll talk about that more later. And then the key ingredient to our solar cell and artificial, or not the solar cell, just artificial leaf is uh, the bismuthanidate, which is the photocatalyst, which allows for the extra voltage to be generated to split water. So the gallium arsenide phosphide, the main part of the solar cell, um, the active material is N-type. So like I just said, we have to turn it into a P-N junction with the zinc deposition and diffusion. This material is generally pretty expensive and as we discussed, it's toxic, the arsenic. So that's why we have the FTO layer to hopefully um, block the water from corroding and releasing the arsenic into the water supply. So further research into this technology would hopefully be done without gallium arsenide phosphide and instead using some other solar cell material. So for uh, the zinc oxide deposition, um, we'll show here in the, uh, a little bit of video of how it's done. But so the gallium arsenide phosphide, that is an n-type material. And in order for a photovoltaic cell to work, you have to create a p-n junction. And this is how it's done. Uh, you apply a, a deposition layer on top of the gallium arsenide phosphide, and then you um, diffuse it in a furnace, um, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, but this is done by spray paralysis, and it is um, it has the gallium arsenide phosphide um, wafer on a 400 degrees um, Celsius heated hot plate. So right here, this is an atomizer, and it has the source material right here. <laughs> The source material is then transformed into a ball that is combined with the gas, it carries it through the tube onto our sample on the hot plate. And again, we'll just show that one more time. Again, this is the atomizer. <laughs> it turns the source material to a vapor or fog. It is then deposited on a sample that is heated by a So the next step after that is the diffusion process, and this is what actually creates that PN junction. Um, you, you take the sample after the, the, the zinc oxide is deposited on the uh, surface, and you place it in a furnace at about 620 degrees Celsius, and you let it bake for about 70 minutes. And this converts a thin layer of the top of the gallium arsenide phosphate into a P-type, um, which that creates the PN junction needed for our solar cell. Uh, so our next step was the deposition of the fluorine doped tin oxide. Uh, this acted as the transparent electrical conductor for our uh, artificial leaf. Um, this allows sunlight to easily travel through the material um, and providing a good electrical contact for the PV cell is essential for our water splitting process. Um, and as Cam mentioned earlier, it provides a chemical protection for the gallium arsenide phosphide as we're worried about the arsenic being uh, 
corroded into the water supply, so it actually prevents corrosion. It also delivers current to the bismuth bandidate uh, photocatalyst, and um, it was applied using that spray paralysis technique that Keaton just went over in the last slide. So the formation of the tungsten oxide by spin coating. Um, the tungsten oxide, like I said, is some people have investigated into it and they believe that it improves the electrical characteristics of the solar cell. Um, so we, about half of our artificial leaves have tungsten oxide in it and half of them don't. Um, so the, a few drops of ammonium metatungstate dissolved in ethylene glycol are applied to the surface and then we spin that surface at about 2,000 RPM for about one minute and then after it's evenly spread and spinned, we bake it on a hot plate about 400 degrees Celsius to form the actual layer of tungsten oxide. Uh, we have a video right here of the formation. So you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to that square. And right about now, it'll start changing color. And right there, that's the formation of the tungsten oxide. We can play that one more time just in case you missed it. It's a pretty quick video. Um, see it goes from a silver to a, kind of a rainbowy color. All right, so now for our bismuth vanadate deposition. It's, uh, it's done by the same process of spray paralysis that we were mentioning before, except this one has a nozzle, so it, has a, uh, it can be spread evenly. Um, this bismuth vanadate is the photocatalyst that facilitates the splitting of water. Um, <laughs> However, this bismuth vanadate, it only generates about 0.3 voltage, um, which is not enough to split water. That is why it's uh, deposited on top of the PV cell. Um, and generally, um, once that is done, it can generate over the 1.2 volts needed to split water. Um, and, and as you can see here, here's the atomizer. It's done by the same process. However, it, is, it has a nozzle right here that moves back and forth, which will be shown in the video in a second. Um, and this picture over here on the left, um, just to give you a little representation of what the bismuth vanadate looks like on the sample, um, this is a two micrometer um, little line right here. Um, also to give you a little bit of perspective on that one, a human hair is typically 75 micrometers, so this is very, very small. Um, as you can see, it's got a lot of bumps and ridges, uh, which increases its surface area, um, which is good because it attracts electrons, which is needed for the uh, water splitting effect. All right, and our last step uh, for making our artificial leaf was the wire attachment. Uh, the wires were attached for testing purposes to uh, measure uh, voltage and current and test the performance of our PV cell as well as our entire leaf. So we had a blue wire on the back of it <coughs> testing. Uh, when testing that, it only tested the whole leaf. And then when testing the orange wire on the front, it was uh, the bismuth, bismuth vanadate so we could accurately measure each portion of our leaf to make sure everything was working. And then when testing both at the same time, it was just the performance of our PV cell. Um, and this is kind of what our, a rudimentary drawing of what our sample looked like in the water. It was submerged in a um, salt water solution and then the light was shined. Um, the reason we had to test is because it was a small sample, so obviously we wouldn't be able to test the amount of hydrogen produced. But getting the voltage and current density allows us to um, do hydrogen production calculations, which we'll discuss later. So this is the testing setup we used. On the right, you can see uh, the solar simulator lamp. On the left is the beaker with our test sample in it, which is shown on the previous slide. That's basically what's going on in the beaker right there. Um, so solar insulation from the sun is generally categorized as about 1,000 watts per square meter. Um, so that's what we set our solar simulator to based on the sensitivity of the simulator and the distance. Um, so yeah, we were mimicking sunlight as accurately as we could. And these are just a few action shots of us in the lab. We <laughs> worked in a clean room, so we had to, they were called bunny suits, so we had to dress up in those. This is what we had to do for three hours at a time. Um, so we didn't attract any dirt or dust to contaminate our samples, so 
as a fun time. All right, these are our solar cell results right here. Um, so last year's results are in the green. Well, first I'll say the x-axis is voltage, the y-axis is current density, which is milliamps per square centimeter. Um, so last year is in the green, and yellow and blue are two samples from this year that we made. So you can see right away that the current density was improved. And also a big problem we fixed off was the tail. And since the tail, um, when the tail was there, that didn't allow enough current to be made at a certain voltage. So keeping that knee really high allows a better current density to be produced at a certain voltage. And we're just gonna give you a little uh, test of our leaf. So you see an ambient, just an ambient light, we're making um, 0.6 around volts. And if I just shine my phone light, which is just very much, we're getting easily over 1.1 1. Uh, 1 volts. So it's just kind of a representation of like how easy, like we're not putting in any electricity into it. It's current, just using the sunlight from just my phone to have a, a voltage output. And obviously sunlight's a little more powerful than the light on your phone. So yeah. it would be producing 1.2 or more if it was the sun, not a phone light. So this is the, uh, the graph showing time and voltage for the bismuth vanadate electrolyte junction. Um, the graph is dropping up and down because we periodically block the sunlight. Um, so you can see that just the bismuth vanadate layer alone is adding that extra 0.3 to 0.4 volts needed to boost up the solar cell to that 1.2 volts. Um, yeah, that's about it for that one. And this is, this is it combined, so the green, I mean the orange one is the graph that I just showed, the bismuth vanadate, and the blue one is the solar cell and the bismuth vanadate layer combined, which is the complete leaf. So it shows time and voltage, and once again it's dropping off because we're blocking the sunlight every now and then. And so the 1.2 line right here, that's what you, is required to split water. So you can see that we're well above that point. So we are successfully splitting water with our artificial leaves. So now the results for our water splitting just by the bismuth vanadate alone. As you can see, it has the ups and downs effects again. And that's because we are uh, blocking light at certain uh, increments um, just for testing purposes. Um, this is a graph that is voltage over current density, um, just like kind of the one before. Um, as you can see, the voltage increases over time, and that's just for testing purposes. There's no really particular reason for it. Um, but the main point to look at right here is the uh, current density, or the current that is producing at zero, zero volts. And that is because current density is a direct correlation to uh, hydrogen generation rate. Um, so that's why it's important to see um, with zero volts how much uh, current we are getting. All right, and this is a graph uh, with our complete leaf layered on top of our, the graph we just showed. Um, as you can see, at zero volts, we're producing a current of over 1.3. I think our best sample was 1.313 um, milliampers. And so this is good because we're showing that we're accurately going to split water and we, at zero volts, which means that the only input is sunlight. We're not having to increase voltage or anything. So that's really good. So the, this is the hydrogen production uh, results. So the equation for producing hydrogen gas is two hydrogen ions plus two electrons yields one hydrogen gas molecule. So you can see that you need the electrons to produce the hydrogen gas molecule. Um, and electric current, as they mentioned, is a measure of how much hydrogen is being produced. So our best artificial leaf had about a current density of 1.3 milliamps per square centimeter which can uh, be correlated into 0.549 milliliters per centimeter squared per hour, which can also be converted into 5.49 liters per meter squared per hour. So just to put that into perspective, um, if we had an artificial leaf the size of a football field, we'd be producing about 29,400 liters per hour of hydrogen gas. And the efficiency of our artificial leaf so like I mentioned, the general uh, solar installation is about 1,000 watts per square meter, so that's our input. 
and hydrogen gas has energy density of 10.7 megajoules per meter cubed or 10.7 times 10 to the third joules per liter. And so with a quick calculation down here, we can convert the joules per liter by multiplying uh, the 5.49 liters per meter squared per hour into how many joules per meter squared we get. And then if you divide joules by seconds, you get watts. So our total output would be 16.3 watts per meter squared. And then if you divide the 16.3 watts per meter squared by 1,000 watts per meter squared and multiply it by 100%, we have an overall efficiency of 1.63% which is really good because anything over 1% in artificial leaf technology is considered a good result. <clears throat> and now just kind of scaling it up in the future of what artificial leaves can be. Um, as you can see here, we mentioned, you know, a football field size artificial leaf could create about 30,000 liters per hour, um, which you can see right here. On um, a practical use, you know, they could be floating out in the, in the saltwater sea and um, just like a bunch of solar farms, and you could have uh, you could have the hydrogen and oxygen pumped to shore, which can be then stored, and then you could burn that um, hydrogen in fuel cells, which can produce electricity. And then the byproduct of burning this hydrogen is just pure water. Um, so it's a very practical use um, that hopefully we can see in the nearby future. And another thing to say about that is um, it would kind of combat global sea rise because you'd be turning the seawater into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. So it wouldn't really be, I mean, you'd have to have a lot of artificial leaf farms to make a, a significant impact on the global sea rise, but you know, it's a little bit of a significance. All right, and I'm just gonna sum things up for you. So our goals overall met, uh, we increased the efficiency, efficiency of our PV cells with our best artificial leaf producing 1.3 milliampers per centimeter squared. Um, we increased the voltage output, which in turn uh, gave us a higher current density, which we then used to calculate a better uh, hydrogen production. Uh, we experimented with tungsten oxide while we had half of them with this material. We didn't notice much different. As, I sa as we said earlier, our best uh, leaf did not have this, so there would probably need to be further research with this material to see if it actually <coughs> um, had a significance. Uh, we improved the soldering of the wires for more accurate testing. This involved an indium tin alloy that was applied to the back contact, and it helped, really helped with our number, uh, gathering our numbers. Um, and we also used inexpensive and scalable manufacturing processes. Uh, this was the spray par paralysis, um, which you can imagine just used, used as like spray painting a car. It can be scaled up easily, so maybe in the future this process can really help with um, <coughs> doing this on a large scale. And in summation, the artificial leaf successfully splits water and sunlight with sunlight as its only input, and our best efficiency was 1.63%. Uh, um, and then we would just like to acknowledge the uh, um, James Madison University uh, College of Integrated Sciences and Engineering, um, Department of uh, Integrated Sciences and, Te and Technology, and then especially a uh, huge thank you to uh, Dr. Lawrence for all his time and effort throughout the semester. Uh, we couldn't have done it without him. Um, so yeah, big thank you. And then, uh, any questions? Yes. Um, so, what are the what are the biggest challenges in scaling up this technology? Uh, currently, we we have a pretty small service area, so we can only test it on a very small scale. Um, I think that basically it would have to be, in order to scale it up, we would need the right like, materials on, or like right inputs onto the surface area. Like the, uh, and the expensiveness, like the gallium arsenide phosphide is a very expensive material. So that's uh, another issue of like scaling it up. Um, yeah. But that was one of our like main things that we were concentrated on was the inexpensive and you know, scalable processes that we used. You kind of like envision um, you know, like a big sheet that gets unrolled and it goes through, you know, a large, you know, spray device and you can go through a furnace to bake it and you can continue it. So, like, the process that we use, Dr. Lawrence thought about it in the scalable processes, but uh, it is obviously very far in the future because the sizes that we are, you know, testing and dealing with were just about the size of your thumbnail, um, even if that sometimes, so. And the process we were using, it already used in manufacturing to create, like, low E windows. So it's easily scaled up. It would just be a matter of 
eliminating that gallium arsenide phosphide material, which is highly expensive. Yes. Yeah, good result and a great presentation. Now, are you planning to uh, publish your result, or have you compared to uh, <coughs> any of the results from any other lab? Uh, I think we're still like right in the process of writing our results right now. Um, it's possible. I know there's other there's samples going on at MIT and Harvard and other colleges. So we it would definitely be something to compare our sample to those samples as well. Um, I know they use a different type of material. I think right now we're one of the only schools testing this gallium or uh, bismuth vanadate uh, material. So it's definitely something uh, that we can publish into the scientific community. You said that you approved it. Uh, what was the old efficiency? Um, the old efficiency of the solar cell was about five or six percent, <laughs> and this solar cell was um, eight or nine. And last year's um, artificial leaf didn't break one percent. Oh, okay, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we got one point six this year. <laughs> but what did you do differently to? Uh, it was using, different, just the yeah. different coating? The different coatings, yeah. yeah. And that electrical contact on the back allowed for more accurate testing. Yes? Is there a reason why you need salt water as opposed to using fresh water for these systems? Um, no, it would work in fresh water too. Um, we were just kind of aiming on salt water because the ocean is just a larger volume of water. But it could totally work in fresh water too. I just didn't know whether the salt did anything to promote the manufacture of the hydrogen. It might make a slight improvement, but it would still work in fresh water. Did you try any of the other than fresh water? We did not, no. Yeah, our main focus was yeah. just the salt water. <laughs> Pretty much all the other. We do need some electrolyte to um, uh, promote conductivity of the water, so we can rely on it. So did you... Um, test to see what the minimum insulation would be to produce hydrogen and uh, did you uh, make an estimate on how many hours per day uh, say at a Harrisonburg latitude that a uh, solar leaf would be producing hydrogen? We did not uh, estimate for a minimum solar installation. We kind of just went with the standard of 1,000 watts per square meter because this is a pretty difficult project already, so we're just trying to get some good results. And I don't think it would be implemented in Harrisonburg ever, just because there's no ocean really. Well, well I had a Harrisonburg latitude, let's say. Oh, yeah, that would probably work there. But we'd have, we did no calculations with that. All right. Yes. So, <clears throat> kind of two questions. In addition to publishing, is there any, <clears throat> excuse me, um, proprietary information that could come out of this, the patents, and those sorts of things? Um, like we were saying, we are the only ones using the bismuth vanadate um, in our artificial leaves. Most of the other ones aren't including that. So that is definitely something that I think we could take with us from that. Um, obviously, you'd have to talk more about that with Dr. Lawrence. I think you know a little bit more, but um, I know for a fact that we are pretty much the only ones um, with the business band-aid on our, our artificial leaf, so. I was also reading up on the guy that kind of um, pioneered this project, David Nassar in Harvard. He has released his results, but kind of not the, from my research, not many of the materials he's used. And so the theory is that maybe he's trying to wait in like pat, like in the patent, um, to patent this, his uh, leaf. So the, the second question then is, um, can you say something to why go through the effort of making an artificial leaf when you could use a solar or photovoltaic panel to make electricity to split the water. I think that our main reason for doing this was how vast the ocean is and basically would be, if the infrastructure would one day support hydrogen energy, um, this could be almost an unlimited source of energy um, with just how much, I mean, the world is like 70% uh, ocean, so. Also, the solar cell by itself doesn't produce enough voltage to split water. That's the main purpose of the artificial leaf here. But That's like a solar panel. Right, so it doesn't produce enough voltage. You um, have to, yeah, you have to put an input voltage in order for a photovoltaic cell to split water. That's why we have a photovoltaic cell with the bismuth band-aid in order to, so then they can create um, split water just by itself without any voltage input. 
So I, th I think I understand what you're after. Uh, ultimately, it becomes a cost issue. So one thing, the leaf efficiency needs to be improved beyond where we've got it now, obviously. But um, if, uh, as, uh, as these gentlemen were saying, if we could scale this up and do roll-to-roll -roll coating or something like that, where we're coating huge areas, then you could essentially make an artificial leaf for the cost of a photovoltaic cell. Now, if you just use PV cells and panels, you have to use PV cells plus electrolyzers. But if you could accomplish the same thing without the two separate things that you have to buy, you could drive the cost down. Yes, you had some nice image, or a nice image of the surface that showed, I think, the, was it a business coating? Yes. Two micrometers. Was that taken before or after you used it, and did you see any deterioration in the surface on use if you did a uh, comparison? I believe that was before. I think it was before, yes. Um, we didn't take any after. Yeah, um, I don't think. Because yeah. I wonder if, if, if you saw any loss in efficiency, if there's any potential for the surface to be poisoned or um, you know, affected by the, by the generation of the... Uh, yeah, yeah, that I do not know. We'd have to look into that one and get back to you on that one. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, that's our final presentation until 1 o'clock in this room. But the junior students do have uh, capstone posters down on the first floor of this building. If you'd like to check those out. Thank you. Thank you.